Hey, uh, great. Thanks, thanks everyone for coming out, and and uh, really happy to be here today. Uh, my name is is Ken Wong, and uh, I'm here to talk about games without gamers. And uh, this is a topic that's been talked about in the community a lot recently. Um, but I'm not really here to talk about who the identity of, uh, the identity of gamers is, or whether the existence of it is a good thing. Um, what I would like to talk about is the relationship between how games are made and how they're consumed, and the relationship between us game developers and, um, and the, the people who play our games. So I work at uh, Us2, where I was the lead designer of this game, uh, Monument Valley. Um, Monument Valley is a game about geometry, impossible architecture, and forgiveness. You guide a princess called Ida to the tops of these buildings called monuments uh, by manipulating architecture. It's a bit unusual for a mobile game in that it's very short and it's very linear. Uh, it has puzzles, but they're not very difficult. It has a story, but the story is not all that clear. There's nothing to collect or upgrade or customize. There's no leaderboard or achievements or social integration. And at a time when freemium rules everything on the App Store, we decided that the best thing for our product was to put it out for $4 with no in-app purchases. But despite ignoring all these rules about how mobile games are supposed to be made, the game's done really well for itself. Um, it broke even after a week. Uh, it reached a million downloads after four months. Uh, we won an Apple Design Award. It's being used to promote the iPhone 6 and, and the Unity engine right now. So we're, we're pretty happy with it. Um, Us2 itself is not actually a games company. Um, our primary business is digital products, and uh, that means apps and other, um, other UX products, um, which means user experience. Uh, most of that work is done for clients like H&M, Tesco, Google, Sony Ericsson. Um, but we also have our own IP projects and our joint ventures. Uh, of the 180 employees, eight of us work on games full time. Uh, and this is kind of an unusual setup for a small games team to be embedded within this larger UX studio. So every day we find ourselves sharing our work and our workspace and our creative culture with all, with all of these smart, digitally savvy people who own these digital devices, but they don't necessarily play games. And I think this has benefited, benefited us who are developing games in two major ways. The first is we're constantly thinking about user experience and how that can be applied to games. And the second is we're constantly reminded that there are so many people out there who still don't play games or don't consider themselves to be gamers. I think it's fair to say that most of us here in this room grew up playing games. We've upgraded our PCs, and we've unboxed new consoles cycle after cycle. We know our RTSs from our FPSs, our MMOs from our MOBAs. We are masters of the control pad, the mouse and keyboard, and the device driver. We are the heroes of the Mushroom Kingdom, Vice City, and Azeroth. We've survived lag, griefers, console wars, and lost save files. We've spilt the same blood on the same soil. It's these experiences that bring us together that make us want to become creators. We love games so much that we chose to make it our way of making a, a living. So it's easy for us game developers to forget how high the barrier of entry can be for people who didn't grow up playing games or haven't played them since childhood. Games can be incredibly intimidating or alternately hopelessly dull to some people. Many feature gratuitous violence or childish fantasy. What some of us might find incredibly easy, noobs can find frustratingly difficult. Many of our greatest works demand play sessions of at least an hour and dozens of hours to complete the full story. A modern gaming console costs a few hundred dollars and comes with a controller with at least 10 buttons and two analog sticks and, and more. That's incredibly complex. So how is a new person, a person new to gaming, going to find the games that, are, that interest them? The average normal person doesn't read 
gaming websites, or magazines. They may not have friends who can help them tell the difference between a Wii and a Wii U, or the difference between a Candy Crush saga and a Banner saga. Who's going to help them find and buy the games that are right for them? Even if some, game, some games can overcome some or all of these obstacles, which many, many games do, the perception that games are demanding, exclusionary, meaningless, and offensive remains in the public mind. This is compounded by the fact that while in other forms of art and entertainment, the audience can sit back and enjoy in a relatively passive fashion, games require participation from the audience. And this required participation is often time-consuming, antisocial, and even masochistic. Comedian Dara O'Brien once noted that video games is the only art form that punishes you for being bad at it and denies you access to the rest of the content. It's therefore not surprising that Roger Ebert dismissed games entirely as a form of art. Whether or not he was correct is arguably still up for debate. But he himself later admitted that he didn't possess the level of games literacy to be able to make such a claim. And this is from a man who won a Pulitzer Prize for criticism. Um, it's not a situation that is easily remedied. You can't simply give someone with such a low level of games literacy a copy of Shadow of the Colossus or Final Fantasy VII or Braid and expect them to understand what makes those games masterpieces. It can take years of accumulated hand-to-eye coordination training and experience in the major works of a genre and research into the cultural context of each of these games to fully appreciate their importance. Perhaps because we game developers grew up living and breathing games, we don't always have a good understanding of what games are or what they can be. Time recently assigned war photographer Ashley Gilbertson to capture photos in The Last of Us. He found the experience of repeatedly killing in order to complete his assignment more distressing than being in an actual war zone. He particularly noted that the lack of distress on the characters' faces was bizarre and served to remove from violence its human element. Connect, to connect with more gamers, we have to become more empathetic. We need to find some common ground between what it's like to have played games all of your life and what it's like to pick up a controller for the first time. We need to remember what it's like to discover new things. We need to remember that gameplay can be more than just waves of monsters and boss runs and inventory management and upgrade trees and achievements. We need to lower the barrier of entry. But wait, you say. Casual games for broad audiences have been around for many years, and look where that's gotten us. Cheap, hollow imitations of real games, stripped of any depth or character or, or story or strategy. Endless clones of matching gems and flapping birds. Products so watered down with ads and monetization and free-to-play features that they resemble gambling more than entertainment. The mobile platform has only accelerated this race to the bottom, the quest for the perfect junk food, sugar-coated, deep-fried, and with a little plastic toy inside. Games like this may fill the stomach, but they don't nourish the soul. Perhaps what we need in order to raise the level of games literacy in wider society is a combination of these ideals. Is it possible to create something that has mechanical or thematic depth and make it simple, intuitive, and accessible? How can you make something epic and complex accessible without dumbing it down? Or conversely, how can you create deep mechanics and a meaningful experience for an audience with a 10-second attention span and a device that doesn't have any buttons? I think it's incredibly difficult, but it's possible. This is the first piece of art created for Monument Valley in Photoshop. It served as both the pitch and as the game design document. It was inspired by one game 
and one piece of art. That piece of art is Ascending and Descending by M.C. Escher. I'd been thinking a long time about how to make a game about architecture, something I'm very passionate about. And I, I had this idea of, of uh, when I saw this image, of keeping the building uh, centered in the camera. And that would, be, that would keep the focus on the architecture. I thought if you could make the goal of the game to guide a figure from the bottom of the building to its highest point, maybe that could be enough to be a game. After thinking about Escher and his work for so long during the production of this project, I think I have some insight into why his art is so universal and so timeless. Escher was able to describe complex geometric concepts and paradoxes to ordinary people by using his skills as an artist. Specifically, he used familiar elements like buildings, people, and animals, and arranged them in surprising and intriguing ways. The more you look at his art, the more you think about space and the nature of representation. Now, the one game that inspired that first piece of art of Monument Valley is this game called Windowsill by Vector Park. It was originally a flash game, but it really shines on the touch screen of the iPad. In each of the game's 10 screens, your goal is to guide this little car to the exit door. And you do that by touching and dragging on all the bizarre, weird stuff in the background. Sometimes there are logic puzzles to solve, and other times it's just a case of trying to tap on the right element or get the right sequence. And what I think is so amazing and, and so intriguing about this game is that it doesn't require anything more than this. The interaction and the animations, they are the content and the mechanic. It's so intuitive that no instructions are needed. It's so beautiful that the designer didn't feel the need to add on any quests or uh, achievements or collectibles. No distractions, just interaction. And so that was the core of the idea for Monument Valley, really. Architecture framed as art and simple, intuitive interactions. We spent a lot of time exploring the possibilities of this game concept, experimenting with gameplay and with art, figuring out what worked and what didn't. These are a few of the level ideas and gameplay ideas and story ideas that we eventually scrapped. In order to stay true to our core ideas, we had to eliminate elements that we initially thought were important to being a proper game. We had plans for secret doors and, and secret rooms and additional challenge levels and for a more ambitious story. But we came to realize that these elements distracted from the honest simplicity of the game. They were tropes that we felt we had brought along as lifelong gamers. We always ended up coming back to the same simple ideas, a love of architecture, graphic composition within the frame of the screen, allowing the user to discover and empathize for themselves. The final idea that we brought over as gamers, the final idea that we had to let go of, was that a longer game makes a better game. We felt that the sense of completion and catharsis that you get when you watch our ending was so critical to the experience that we decided that we had to help as many people as possible complete Monument Valley, and that that was more important than making the game longer or more difficult. The result is that for many people, young and old, Monument Valley is the first game that they've ever completed. In the months since Monument Valley's release, which was on the same day as uh, Hearthstone was uh, soft released, uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what made the game successful and uh, how that was able to mean so much to a wide variety of people. So here's one thought. Visuals are the most immediate way of grabbing someone's attention and standing out in the marketplace. All of our screenshots and our trailers and the icon and the logo were all carefully crafted to say, this is artistic and playful and mysterious. This is worth you downloading. Uh, 
the interesting and, and beautiful visual design was our way of lowering the barrier to get people to try out the gameplay. In a way, the visuals are a sort of Trojan horse to get people to, to, to get into the interaction. Once downloaded, we made sure that these interactions were so intuitive and yet constantly surprising. And the goal was to get people to stay chapter after chapter. We were using gameplay as another Trojan horse, used to get people to discover the story and the deeper themes within our work. And all of this is on the ultimate Trojan horse, a games platform disguised as a computer, disguised as a lifestyle device, disguised as a phone. Hundreds of millions of people have a state-of-the-art gaming platform and an instant game store in their pocket, without, maybe without even realizing it. This is our most underappreciated tool for improving games literacy. And that's our secret, really, a series of nested Trojan horses, or Trojanception. I think that this approach of layering depth within accessibility was the key part of what made Monument Valley both a commercial product and an artistic endeavor. And after all, isn't that the same trick that MC Escher used to, to make his work accessible and intriguing to generations of fans? Complexity and depth and beauty hidden within accessible visuals. There will always be games for gamers. Shooting, running, and jumping are just too much fun to go away. Every generation deserves a state-of-the-art platformer and shooter and RPG. Like myths passed down from generation to generation, some mechanics and tropes will live on forever, getting better with each retelling and reinvention. Gaming is a culture of people linked not by blood or nation, but by how we reimagine reality. But we must also grow and mature as a culture, as an art form, and as an industry. We must recognize and confront the borders of games and make sure that these are boundaries that we explore and challenge, not categories that keep us contained and divided. We have to escape the trope of violence as the default form of conflict resolution. We have to escape money being the default form of reward. We have to tell more diverse stories. If we are to evolve the gamer stereotype of the socially inept uh, basement-dwelling man-child must be put to bed. This stereotype does not serve the game players or creators or our art form. I want playing games to be seen as a pastime as ordinary as watching movies and reading books. And I want the most dedicated of game players to be seen not as militia, but as enthusiasts, collectors, and scholars. We need more and better entry points into gaming. Star Wars may not be necessarily the most sophisticated or well-written or well-made movie, but it's the perfect entry point into the joy and wonder of cinema. Throughout the short history of our art form, there have been games that expanded upon what games could be and found whole new audiences. The evolution of our art form depends on games like these. One way of looking at, at things is that these are games made without gamers in mind. Another point of view is that these are the games that define what it means to be a gamer. Or maybe, when everyone's a gamer, no one will be. Thank you.